Om Sam Sarasvati Namaha Namaste. Namaste, everybody. And tonight we're going to begin on chapter 12. And we request that everybody recite along with us. Humble Swaha, Humble Vat 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 Dishanki, you give it to Maha Swa, Sri Bhagavan of Hachat Swa. Maya Dishya, no ye mam, Nidya Yuta, as a day. Sadaya Pariku Pitas, Hey me, Yuta, the Mamata Swa. He parts from Nadishyam, Aviatam Pariku as a day. Sarvatra Gamachin Yamcha, who does the Matalan Rivan Swap? Sandy Hamin Rika Raman, Sarvatra Sam Budaka, the Pratipanti Maneva, Sarva Buddha Kitirta Swap. Klesho Dika does rush time, and Yakta Sakajeta Sam. Yata di Kathir to Kam, the Abadi Varaki Swa. Ye to Sarbani Kamani, my ye Sanyaka Makaram, and Yani Neva Yogina, Mangaka Tatu as the day Swa. Tishamahan Smudarta, reduce and Sarasagarad. Babani Nachirat Partham, Maya Bishi Prajit Tham Sva, Maya Babana Hadat Sva, Maya Budin Nivesaya, Nivesis Yasti and Maya Babana Hadat Sva, Hadat Sva, Sva, Hadat Sva, Hadat Sva, Hadat Sva, Hadat Sva, Hadat Sva, Hadat Amyasa yogi natato, Machini chapdun tenanjaya swaha. Amyasa yapta pantausi, Makarma paro papa, Makarta mami karmani, Kurvansini mabakusi swaha. Ate the tapia shatosi, Kartuma yoga masrita, Sarva kama palatiaga. Tata Guru Yatta Ban Swa Sri Yogi Yanamam Yasyak Yanada Nam Yishi Sate Yanada Karma Bala Satyak Tiaga Chanti Nirantaram Swa Adwishta Satabutana Oitra Guru Nareva Chan Nirmavam Samadukatsu Kachami Swa Sankhushta Satatam Yogi Yatatma Tri Rindishtaya Mayarvitama No Budir Yoma Patyasmi Priya Swa Yatma No Dvijate Loke Lutlokta No Dvijate Chaka Arshama Arshama Yogo Dir Mukhoya Satchami Priya Swa Anapiksha Suchir Daksha Udasino Kadakyata Sarvaharapa Priyani Yumam Bhakyasme Prikasva Yumna Ishyati Nadvishti Nasochati Nakamshati Shubha Shubha Priyani Bhakti Madhyasme Priyasva Samashatra Nami Precha Tata Manapapanako Sitoshna Tukatukeshu 
If you are unable to maintain the absorption of your consciousness in me, then wish to reach me by the practice of union, conqueror of wealth, Arjuna. So any kind of yoga practice that you can use, Dan, Gan, Bhakti, and Karma, we've spoken about the four. Meditation, or paying attention. Gan is knowledge, wisdom. Bhakti is devotion, and all three of these unite in every action that becomes karma. And now, reach me by the practice of yoga, by the practice of union, by doing whatever action you perform with knowledge and devotion and, and a state of attention. And that becomes karma yoga. If you are incapable of practice, then do actions for me. By performing actions for me, you will attain perfection. So look, if you're not a yogi, and you can't twist yourself like a pretzel, and you can't spit out all the mantras like Srini does, and just uh, off the tip of his tongue, uh, he knows them all by heart already. And if, if you're incapable to put flowers in the right place like, like Gautam does, then at least do some action for me. Whatever you do, do for me. And you'll have a good time. It will be a fun thing to do. And if you're not able to work for me, if you're not able to do this, then take refuge in union with me, control your own self, and renounce the fruits of all your actions. Renounce the fruits of all actions. In other words, if, if you can't do the action for me, then do it for yourself and then give me the fruit. Keep your own motivation, keep your own intention, keep your own whatever makes you do the action, finish it, and then bring the fruits as an offering to God. Indeed, better than practice is wisdom. Better than wisdom is meditation. And renunciation of the fruit of action excels even meditation. For from renunciation comes immediate peace. In fact, that is the way of peace, is renunciation. And it's, we're not talking about the, uh, I surrender as the last resort. We're talking about renunciation as the, the offering in equilibrium. It's a privilege to give you this. It's not, all right, I'll pay. It's, I want you to have. Without enmity among all existence, friendly, compassionate, without attachment or egotism, the same in pain and pleasure, patient. The being of union is always satisfied, has controlled his or her own self, has firm confidence, and such a one is my devotee and is beloved by me. That's a description of my devotee. Someone who has no enmity, who's friendly, compassionate, doesn't have any egotism, and doesn't put out their attachment. The same in going through all the opposites. He's patient, controlled himself, keeps himself satisfied, has firm confidence, dear dishvishwash, such a one is my devotee and is beloved to me, or beloved by me. From whom the world experiences no enmity, and who experiences no enmity from the world. Why, just like my friend Sam, everybody loves him, and he knows it. Who is liberated from joy, envy, fear, and anxiety, such a one is beloved by me. Who is free from expectations, pure, efficient, the servant of circumstances, untroubled, who has renounced all undertakings, such a one is my devotee and is beloved by me. Who has neither attraction nor repulsion, neither joy nor sorrow, who has renounced both purity and impurity, apavitra, apavitra, 
He's renounced both purity and impurity. I'm not the judge. Such a one is my devotee and is beloved by me. Who remains the same to foe and friend, in honor or disgrace, in cold or hot, in pleasure and pain, who is free from attachment, to whom blame or praise are equal, who is silent and satisfied with everything, whose home is everywhere, whose mind is steady, who is full of devotion to me, that man is beloved by me. Indeed, they who observe this immortal ideal of perfection with full faith as has been declared regarding me as the supreme, those devotees are extremely beloved by me. And here ends the 12th chapter. Do we have any questions? Please. Something in verse 13? Yes. Lord Krishna says, his devotee is the same in pain or pleasure. Yes. That suggests that devotees too experience pain and pleasure. Absolutely, but we, the body experiences pain and pleasure, but the devotee is the same. That means we identify with the soul. We are one with the eternal soul. So therefore the body will exp experience pain. The body will experience pleasure. That does not change me. That doesn't change my soul. That doesn't change my spark of divinity within me. The divine is within me. The wearer of the body is experiencing the pain of the body. But I'm not pained. The wearer of the body who wears the body will experience the pleasures and the pains of the body, but that's not my problem. Swamiji, when, uh, suppose we are aspiring to be that devotee. Yes. And we feel pain, either mental or physical. Yes. What is the uh, form, is there a formula that we can use as soon as we experience that emotion? Absolutely. They offer them, offer the fruits of your karma to the divine and they're no longer yours and now you are the witness of the pains and pleasures of that body but they're not yours so then you've given up attachment and when you give up attachment comes peace upon renunciation comes peace it says it very clearly who has renounced finds peace. So that, that is the process. Now in the Chandi, we call upon the Divine Mother to take away all the thoughts. Pleasure is a thought. I like this. Pain is a thought. I don't like this. So now in calling upon the Divine Mother, hey, you take away these thoughts and let me just remember you. I'm remembering her and she's remembering the thoughts. She's dealing with the thoughts. They're no longer my problem. She takes them away. And the pain or the sensation may reside in the body but this wearer of the body regards it as a sensation of the body and not necessarily mine. And it's not my pain. It's not my pleasure. It's a sensation of the body that all bodies feel. But I can transcend that sensation by giving up attachment. Are there other questions? There's a question from Nanda from San Jose. Namaste, Nanda Ma. This is a follow-up on our discussion on chapter 11. Yes, Ma. About God being a demanding boss but a joy to work for. Can you please share your experience about working for God? Thank you so much for the inspiration. Mm, very hard question you ask. 
Uh, that's not quite fair. <laughs> but you can see, you can see uh, in my behavior, in my attitudes, in the way I sit, in the way I read, in the way I breathe, you can see uh, how, what a joy it is to work for such a demanding boss. Uh, and now you'll have to describe something of my experience <laughs> because you see it. I can't describe it myself because I'm not there to, to experience it. I'm only the witness of the experiences that that sadhu Baba is having. I can't describe it because it, they're not my experiences. Were they my experiences, I wouldn't be sitting this way or breathing this way or sharing my Bob in this way. Are there other questions? Question from Usha from Canada. Namaste, Usha Ma. It is a said, Swamiji, that we should have some of the attributes of the Ishta we worship so that there can be a relationship between us. Absolutely. The more we associate with others, the more we become like those who, with whom we associate. It's, it's the law of karma. If I hang out with nice people, I'm going to become a nice guy. And if I hang out with a bunch of dharma bums, I'm going to become good for nothing. And you know what they say about sadhus. Some people are good for some things. Other people are good for other things. Sadhus are good for nothing. So, if you associate with the deity, you're going to assume the qualities, inculcate the qualities of your ishta, without a doubt. And that's the purpose of the sadhana, that is the sadhana, to associate with your ishta to the exclusion of delusion, so that all you have is this love affair, you become her. And you radiate her qualities. You give up your own, we give up our own individual egotism and attachments and take on her characteristics. So, uh, Swamiji, actually, Usha has also written that how can we then, given this, ha have authentically have relationship with the formless when we still perceive ourselves as a form? It would be somewhat inauthentic and self-contradictory, would it not? Yes, it would. And that's why it says here that the effort of, of those who, whose consciousness strives to recognize the unmanifest is greater. For it is difficult for those with bodies to reach the goal of the un unmanifest. And that's just what they're saying. As long as we've got bodies, uh, we can't reach the goal of the unmanifest because we have to give up our bodies. Now that doesn't mean we have to leave them permanently, but we can transcend them by raising our consciousness above the body and bringing the consciousness outside the container. And not being limited by this limited form in any, in any way any longer, then we can experience for the time that we have the privilege to be outside the body, we can experience unlimited consciousness. Wendy from New Jersey, Swamiji thanks you for all the blessings you sent to us, she says. And Wendy has a question on verse 13. Yes. Wendy says that, uh, I have seen the last word translated as forgiving. Swamiji, you translate it as patient. Can you please explain and speak to this difference? Yes, uh, it, it is both. Kshama is both patience and forgiveness. And oftentimes I have translated it as patient forgiveness and forbearance. Uh, so it, it, in Sanskrit, the word, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has many usages that we would ascribe different terms to in English. And this term embodies them all because when you are patient, you are forbearing, you are forgiving, you are tolerant, you are compassionate, and they're all coming together in one kshama. And 
Uh, so that's why the, the difference in the translation. Thank you very much for your accuracy. I really appreciate your, your attention to detail. Keep me honest. A question from Nanda on purity and impurity. Yes, Mom. So, uh, Nanda says, Swamiji, I thought we were trying to be purer by doing tapasya. Why then renounce purity? Can Swamiji please help us understand? Uh, Nanda, Ma, remember the story of the three thieves. Uh, they came upon a victim. The one thief said, this guy's of no use to us. Let's just kill him throw him in a ditch, and take all his valuables. Second thief said, there's no reason to kill him. Uh, he didn't do anything. Let's just tie him up and bind him and throw him in the ditch and take his valuables. And that's what they did. And the third thief went away with his share of the loot, and after a while he got feeling some remorse and feeling bad. And he said, that poor guy, he's all beat up and bruised and bound and laying in a ditch. And we took everything away from him. Uh, let us, uh, I'm going to go back and help him. And he found the victim, he untied him, he set him free, he bandaged his wounds, he put him on his own horse and took him to the main road. And the victim turned to the thief and said, you've been so kind to me. Oh, why don't you come to my house and let me show my hospitality? And the thief said, no, the police will certainly ask me why I was with the thieves in the first place. Now, the first thief was Tamaguno, who says, let's just injure and take for ourselves. The second thief was Rajaguna, who said, let's just bind these individuals in the sansar and throw them in a ditch and take as much as we can get for ourselves. The third thief was Satpaguna. He's purity. And he can show us the way home, but he can't enter into the house. Because he too is a thief. So Nanda, that's the reason that ultimately we're going to use purity to transcend both purity and impurity. We make ourselves a lifestyle based on purity, and then Thereafter, we cease to discriminate for others. We only discriminate for ourselves. This is my path, and I'm going on this path. You choose any other path that you choose. I give you my blessings. But this is my path. And that's how we transcend the impure and the pure. Apavitra pavitra va. Sarvabhastangatobhiva, they are within every single object, sarvabhastha. Every all, every bhastu has apavitra and pavitra. Uboy, the two. So, yes, Marit Pundari Kaksham. Whoever remembers the lotus eye Vishnu, the consciousness which pervades all, Suti, he becomes completely pure. He's conveyed to radiant purity. Suchi, yeah, he's completely such. So that's our path. By making ourselves pure and discriminating as to the qualities of purity for me. Not for you, for me. I can tell you what kind of character I wish to have. And that will be my criteria to discriminate for me. What's my lifestyle? Now you can choose yours and let everyone choose their own. And those who uh, are, have a similar criteria to me, please come to the Navy Monday we'll share our concepts of purity. And those who have other ideals, there's a whole world out there. Enjoy. Other questions? Uh, Michael has a follow-up question to Nanda's first question. Yes, yes, Michael. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Namaste, Karen. Michael is asking, if the actions are not Swamiji's, how does he decide what to do? Whoa. <laughs> 
do you know there's a, there's an a priori knowledge where you know in your heart. You don't have to think about it. You don't reason it out. God speaks to you and says, this is the way for you. This is, this is the criteria. If they're not my actions, they must be uh, for the benefit of some other larger self outside of me. Either for my family, either for my community, either for God's creation. And using that criteria, I'm trying to decide what is the best, but they're not mine. So it becomes like Jonathan the king, who said, uh, yes, this whole creation, this whole kingdom is m under my authority, but it's not mine. I'm the custodian for a higher power. Now what's in the best interest of the many that I can decide my decision will affect the many and bring about the best outcome for the, as many as possible. Kumari from Valley Hill has a question. Yes, Kumari, well, namaste. Should a spiritual seeker be concerned about spiritual progress? And if so, how do we know that we are spiritually growing or going forward towards God, consciousness, or union with God? How to stay on the straight path going forward with full consciousness that the sadhaka is growing? Kumari, by spiritual, I presume you mean metaphysical. And if it is metaphysical, it is not physical. So then how can you measure any progress? You can only understand your own feeling. And that will change from moment to moment. So why concern ourselves about progress in the metaphysical? Let's take some definable goals. There are certain goals in our spiritual practices, quote unquote, the milestones. Did I memorize this mantra? Did I expand the length of my asana? Did I refine the pronunciation? Did I serve my guru with a pure, with a pure soul, with a, with a true longing to do the best I possibly could? Or did I just try to get the job out of the way as quickly as possible so I could go on to the next thing in my life? These will be demonstrable goals which you can measure. Why worry about measuring the metaphysical? How can you measure metaphysical? Feel your own attitude inside. Did I mean there are, choose goals which are which are practical goals, and then you'll know that you're making progress. If you say, "Oh, I want to be so spiritual. I want my life to be led by, guided by God's will," there's no way to verify that it, that you got it or that you don't have it right now. These are all altruistic expressions, but they have no validity in the spiritual search. This isn't something we search for. We search for a definable goal. So now let's set, make a sankalpa and let that sankalpa be definable. I, this character, Swami, Promise not to move my knees until I recite this text. That is a definable goal. And now I have criteria by which I can understand did I achieve the goal or not. And as I get deeper and deeper into my spiritual practices with definable goals, we'll feel, we'll feel the change that's coming over us. You won't have to measure because it's not measurable. How can you measure the limits of infinity? How can you measure an attitude? So choose definable goals that are advancing our, 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 our objective, advancing us towards our objective of becoming good sadhus. And that would be sufficient. Question from Kiki Bussell from Chicago. Hi Kiki, namaste. 
Hello to you, Swamiji, after many years. Namaste. Um, what is the difference between worshipping Krishna as the body or not as the body? When we worship the formless, do we lose the sweetness of the worship of the form of our beloved when we actually become the beloved? Oh, there comes a point in every relation where there's just no way to separate us. We become one. And when we become one, we move from with form to beyond form. But as every perception has a duration, the perception of the formless is in eternity for as long as it lasts. And then it comes back into the perception of we, meaning the two of us. So by worshiping Krishna with form, we get to experience without form, beyond form, the metaphysical Krishna. And in the love and joy and communion of that union with the metaphysical Krishna comes the love that brings us back into, I don't want to be sugar, I want to eat sugar. And now we get to come back and step back from our union say, wow, it's you whom I love. Usha has another question. Certainly, Usha. Uh, Swamiji, I was told that in modern times, Sri Ramakrishna re-established the importance of prayer, which was almost lost in India after the Vedic period. Uh, Swamiji, how do we understand prayer, that is, petitionary prayer, and how does it relate to chanting? Chanting seems like prayer to me also, is it? Then it's certainly not lost in India. I agree with you, Usha. Chanting is prayer, and prayer is meditation, and prayer and chanting and meditation are one. It just depends which side you're looking at. If you're looking at the outside, you may say that person is praying, or you may say that person is chanting. And if you look at the inside, you may say that person is in very deep meditation. So I think the three are synonymous. I don't see a distinction, and I don't see at any time when prayer was lost to India, especially since the Vedas. I see that the Vedas are full of prayers, they're full of hymns, they're full of shuktas, they're full of mantras, they're full of practices, that each one of them is a prayer. Everything we do in life is a prayer. And if we do with the mantra, we're in meditation. And if we're in meditation with the mantra and the prayer becomes uh, chanting, poetry in motion. Our lives become the expression of the poetry. Um, Wendy has a question. Swamiji, what happens if we don't complete a sankalpa? Are we creating more karma? Well, always we're creating more karma. Every action creates more karma. And if we don't create a sankalpa, we have to say, Kshama, please forgive me. Be patient with me. Give me patient forgiveness and let me try again tomorrow. That means that we have to be patient and forgiving to ourselves as much as we will want to be patient and forgiving to others, as much as we will want God to be patient and forgiving with us. It's not just a one-way street. You forgive me. That's not fair. This is a, a religion of equity. And if we want forgiveness and patience and understanding from God, we're going to want to give forgiveness and patience and understanding to others. And we will want to be patient and forgiving and giving understanding to ourselves as well. On every level. On all three levels. So, if you can't fulfill the sun culpa, and there are many reasons, I understand, that we'll have to change the, modify our contract with God in the process. And if that happens, say, 
Excuse me. Please forgive me. Kshama Kora. Shama Shma. Please forgive us. And uh, at the back of the Chandi, we have a Kshama Prathana, a prayer for forgiveness. And it says, hey, I commit thousands of mistakes. Please forgive me. Again, at the Sprintya Brahmtya I commit mistakes from ignorance, uh, from foolishness, from just plain confusion. I commit acts of uh, omission and acts of commission. Please, Tatsarvam Shanyatam Devi, all of that. Please forgive me. I'm trying to be the best I can possibly be. And I'm praying to you to make me better. Now, I'm not professing to be the best at everything I do. I'm trying and I'm requesting you to make me better. That's the prayer. Kumari has a question about verse 12. Yes, Kumari. Kumari says in verse 12, Lord Krishna tells us that wisdom is better than practice. Uh, doesn't practice lead to wisdom? Yes. Uh, is renunciation of the fruit of the action considered tapasya? Can Swamiji please comment? I would believe that renunciation is the apex of tapasya. We don't, tapasya is a practice through which we achieve something. Renunciation is the giving up of that something once it has been achieved. So in tapasya, we are performing an action in order to attain a goal. And once we reach the goal, then renunciation is the giving up of the object of that goal in order to achieve a higher purpose even still. So, yes, uh, wisdom is achieved through tapasya. And renunciation comes after the wisdom is achieved. That is the highest wisdom. Believe it. I don't need it anymore. I just did the tapasya to, not to achieve the goal, I did the tapasya just because I love to demonstrate the sincerity of my love for you. The tapasya wasn't to achieve a something. The tapasya was just the natural expression of my, my love, my joy. And now it is my privilege to renounce whatever I was achieved and give it to you. Because you're my beloved. And I want you to have The thing that was so valuable to me is just a small offering that I can give to you. Samji, how does this actually verse 15? Yes. No, verse 16, where Lord Krishna says, Sarva Ramba Parityagi renounce, he yes. who has renounced all undertakings. Yes. How, how does that connect to what you were just saying? What does it mean you renounce all undertakings? Everything I do, everything I embark upon, everything I undertake, every, every action I try to perform is just the privilege of expressing my love for you. And I want to show you the intensity and the sincerity of my love, my devotion by performing this action. It's not for me. I don't need it. What I need is you to know that I love you. That's what I need you to know. I don't need a widget or another widget. I just need to show you that I, my love is pure, my heart is pure, and I'm sincere about what I'm saying to you. 
I'm not just, yeah, yeah, I, I know it's easy to sit here all night long and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but there comes a point in our relationship when one of us has got to get up off his duffet and do something. And I want to do it to show you that I'm, I'm sincere. I want to do it as an expression of that love. I want to show you my sincerity. through this undertaking. And ultimately, I will become an undertaker. <laughs> so Swamiji, what we renounce is not the undertaking, but our motivation to do the undertaking. It's not a selfish undertaking. It's an undertaking for God. Yes, it doesn't mean we desist from action. It means that we act for you and not for me. Question from Rod from Mountain View. Namaste, Rod. Does discrimination belong to the soul or the mind? Which one makes decisions about the actions we perform? Do you know, Rod? I believe the mind presents a number of alternatives, and the soul makes the election. All the alternatives are faults of the mind. And our discrimination is a faculty which is attached to the soul, which says, ah, that one. And once we choose, we elect that alternative, we go back into thought. And the soul reflects upon the thoughts. So with the consciousness of the soul, is a discriminating factor which is born of the conscience. And the conscience is a determination of right and wrong or value system according to the individual. And now the mind bears a number of alternatives and the, cons the consciousness, the soul, consults the conscience which is this value system and then discrimination becomes effective and says I elect this alternative or I reject that alternative and then the soul is brought back into thought Samaji, Wendy has a question Krishna describes all the characteristics of those beloved by him what about someone that doesn't follow any of these practices? Are they not beloved? No, they are not. No, Krishna loves those who observe, observe this immortal ideal of perfection with full faith. Regarding me as supreme, those devotees are extremely beloved by me. Now, Krishna resides within all of creation, but those who choose to come to God, God takes ten steps to run towards them. And those who choose not to go towards God, God says, okay kids, go out and play. When you're ready for me, come on home, I'll be here. I love you, I welcome you all, I will, when you come home to me, I will open my arms to you. But while you're out there playing in the world, you're on your own until you choose to come to me. So yes, he loves them, but not in the same intensity as he loves his family of, of devotees who say, oh, we want to be with you. Uh, Wendy, you, you have many friends and many associates and many uh, uh, people that you have known in your life. But those who are closest to you are the ones that you interact with most frequently. And you love them even more than the casual acquaintances that you've met throughout your life. In the same way, Krishna loves us all, but some of us are casual acquaintances. We, we, we just got a piece of incense in the airport. 
and others come to the Devi Mandir and sit with their knees on the floor and read the whole Bhagavad Gita and translate every verse and look for an application in our own lives and maybe he loves us a little more. Hey. Uh, Samji, on verse 8, Kumari has a question. Yes, Kumari, ma'am. Lord Krishna asks us to fix our mind on him. But really speaking, Swamiji, how much of the mind can be fixed on God when we are working in the world? If we pay attention and concentrate, isn't this the same thing as fixing mind on God? Well, there, there are two parts to the equation, Kumari. Uh, one is to fix our mind on the form of God, and the second is to fix our mind on the work that we're doing for God. So if you're concentrating and you're paying attention and you're doing an efficient job knowing that you're going to please God, you're going to please Guru, you're making a benefit to your family, you're making a benefit to your community, your clients are going to be happy with your efficiency and they're going to be overjoyed to be happy, to have the privilege to work with you as I am, then you know you're doing it for God. And now you've renounced your selfishness. If you think, how can I cut corners and do the least and get the most and get it over with as quickly as possible? And I want to be out the door. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I'm out of here. Then you know there's selfishness there. And Krishna is not so pleased. You're not thinking about God as the recipient. You're not thinking about efficiency as the way of that you propose to do it. So now your life is being guided by other principles. And you remain in duality. I think these are the criteria. One, thinking about what you're doing as an efficient action that you're going to offer. And two, thinking about the recipient, ultimately, who's going to receive your offering. Swamiji, so, so the, all the people who are asking these questions, they have a special message for you. Namaste. Their message is, Beloved Swamiji, thank you for your patience in answering all our questions with love from the online interrogators and drillers. <laughs> thank you interrogators <laughs> and drillers. <laughs> It's worse uh, to, to be in the dentist office, <laughs> having been drilled by a number of professionals. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be with you. I really appreciate your association. Uh, I believe that this type of activity is going to bring us all closer to an understanding of how to proceed towards our spiritual goals. Uh, and this is my objective to share uh, with all of you, and I can tell by your questions the sincerity of your search, and I respect you all so very deeply. Om Sam Saraswati Namaha. Namaste. Namaste.